much. And yeah, we'll make a transition now from development and mining to, uh, to exploration. And, and uh, it's good to be back to provide an update on North Arrow. We are a diamond exploration company. Um, we have a, a team of exploration professionals and diamond professionals that have been involved in the discovery and the evaluation and the development of diamond projects in Canada uh, and throughout the world. Um, we've been at this for uh, about the last four years, a little over, and in that time we've uh, raised over $18 million and our shareholders have benefited from those raises. Um, they've been exposed to the collection of a bulk sample at our now yet diamond project from the Q1 to 4 Kimberlite, and I'll take you through some of the results of that. Um, they've been exposed to about a half dozen drill programs, which have led to the discovery of uh, Kimberlites at our Piku project in Saskatchewan, which remains Canada's most recent diamond discovery. Um, and also, I think, in the neighborhood of a dozen till sampling programs and a similar number of geophysical programs, all of which has been advancing our exploration projects to the point where we have five other projects now that are at the discovery stage, which means that next round of exploration work could lead to the discovery of a diamond-bearing Kimberlite. Um, I mentioned the, the raises that we've done. We've been able to do it primarily on a warrant-free basis, which has kept our, our capitalization structure very clean at 56 million shares outstanding, just 61 uh, and change, fully diluted. And an important uh, part of that is because we have a very strong insider shareholder base. People involved, I'm not going to take you through the bio of everybody. If you'd like to come by our booth afterwards, 2707, I'd be happy to, to take you through the background of everyone uh, involved, but I think we're more interested here in the projects themselves. Um, so I'll take you through them. All of our properties are in Canada. Our main advanced project is called Now Yet. We have been calling it Kilalugak, and we're in the process of transitioning it to something that's a, a little bit more pronounceable. Uh, and I'll take you through a lot of the, the work that we've been doing there. Um, we have another five projects, as I mentioned, that are all at the discovery stage. We've been picking away, advancing all of these properties, and, uh, and I'll take you through some of those just to, to show that that next round of work could lead to a discovery. We're always keeping our, our eyes open for, for grassroots projects. And then also just we'll touch on, on the gold side, we have a legacy property up at Hope Bay that's immediately north of the Doris Mine. We're just three kilometers uh, north of, of Doris where the first gold bar was poured just a couple of weeks ago. And more just as a reminder of other opportunities to get some value in the, in the company. But our focus is diamonds and, and the Now Yet project, which is advanced, as I mentioned. And, and I'm going to take you through a series of slides just to try and get across the fact that this project, it really it checks a lot of the boxes that you want to see for an advanced project. Um, our focus of the exploration is our Q1 to 4 Kimberlite near the community of Now Yet. And, uh, and I'll end with a discussion about the, the value proposition that we see in a population of orangey yellow diamonds that are in the Kimberlite. But first of all, in terms of jurisdiction, Nunavut is an area where you can permit a mine. I mentioned Doris is in production. They're just, uh, starting production right now. Uh, Agnico has been operating at the Meadowbank gold mine for the last several years and just a couple weeks ago committed another $1.2 billion to the development of two additional mines. So you can permit a mine and move a project forward to that stage in Nunavut. Being on tidewater in the high Arctic is really important. Um, there is a real history of successful mine development in the Arctic for deposits on tidewater. We think of Nanasivik and, and Polaris. Doris is actually going to join that list now. And Q104 is, uh, it, it is on tidewater as well. This is in the foreground. You can see a portion of the Kimberlite and then nine kilometers away. That's the sea lift servicing now yet, just a couple of years ago. We took advantage of that sea lift in the collection of our bulk sample to be able to do it on a very cost-effective basis. But just projecting forward and thinking about possible mine development, we think that shipping costs and the freight charges to just get stuff here to develop a mine would be on the order of about half of what the costs are to get them to the Northwest Territories mines at Lac de Gras, utilizing the winter road. And that's, that's huge. The other box that it checks is it's a big deposit with plenty of room to expand. It's about 12 and a half hectares in size, Q1 to 4 is. The current resource down to 200 meters depth is about 48 million tons with a total diamond recovery grade of, of just over a half a carat per ton. There's room to expand that and a target for further exploration just down to 300 meters depth. We could add another 15 or so million tons with a, with a drilling program that we're planning on, on carrying out this year. So there's room to expand Q1 to 4, but there's also another 15 bodies in this area that need to be evaluated. So there's over about a 20 kilometer strike length. We are, uh, we're focusing on Q1 to 4, however, for the time being because it is the biggest Kimberlite discovered there. It has the most diamonds in it, and it's the closest to town. We mentioned the sort of the grade and the size. The other interesting aspect of the body is this funny horseshoe shape. And if you start playing around with dropping pits and thinking about possible strip ratio scenarios, uh, it's a very low strip ratio that we're looking at for this. If we take in just our inferred level resource down to 200 meters, we're looking at a strip ratio of less than two to one. If we're successful in, in identifying and, and, and proving up that tonnage down to 300 meters depth, that's our target for further exploration. We're still looking at a strip ratio of less than three to one. Uh, and that really helps. Strip ratio matters because you're just you're mining fewer tons for each ton of ore that goes through the processing plant. 
um, as a comparison to the Lac de Gras mines, which are much higher grade, but the resources and the reserves are spread over a number of different bodies. Just using Gatchaquay as an example, the life of mine strip ratio there is estimated to be about 10 to 1. So this low strip ratio goes a long way to addressing the fact that the body is a lower grade than, than what we're used to seeing in the Lac de Gras mines. Um, just a little cartoon just to show why strip ratio matters. With a lower strip ratio, you're mining more ore, and, uh, and that really impacts your cost. This is just sort of a generic scenario um, looking at a few examples. But you're lowering your cost, and you're able to uh, address, as I mentioned, the, the lower grade aspect for, for Q1 to 4. But ultimately, we're looking at diamonds in the deposit and, uh, and what they might be worth. We collected a bulk sample in 2014, collected 384 carats, had those diamonds valued, uh, and that valuation, the price range was between $43 and, and a possible high of $92 a carat. Um, it's important though to, to keep in mind that the number one conclusion from that study was the fact that we didn't have enough carats to actually come up with a value for the diamonds. The parcel was too small and it was further complicated by the fact that, and you can see it in this photo here, uh, these are all of the diamonds in, in the parcel that were about 0.2 of a carat and bigger, that there's this population of yellow diamonds. There's a real yellow hue here and the fact that there are these two different populations complicates valuation even further. So we spent a uh, better part of the last year, year and a half doing two things. One is taking a look at the the size frequency analysis, and then also doing a cutting and polishing exercise. Looking at the, the evaluation of the size frequency distribution of these diamonds um, first, as I mentioned, empirically we are seeing a lot of diamond, yellow diamonds in the parcel. Uh, as we reported the results, we, we reported that we're seeing, as we go into consecutively coarser sizes, we're seeing proportionally more and more of these yellow diamonds. So it seemed that there is a coarse distribution to these diamonds. One of the things that we, we then did is a, an infrared analysis of uh, spectral analysis of the diamonds, and we were able to clearly show that the yellow diamonds are much, much, much younger than the non-yellow diamonds. They're totally different populations. And what that tells us, other than being kind of geologically cool, um, what it tells us is that it's okay and appropriate to model the two different diamond populations separately. And when we do that, we get, we get model plots that look something like this. So this is a, the, uh, a grade, model grade size curve of the total diamond parcel. We're looking at number of diamonds essentially on the y-axis, size of diamonds increasing on the x-axis. This is what the total parcel looks like. And in this case, we're pulling out the dark yellow diamonds and we get a curve that looks something like this. What's interesting is lower because there's fewer carats, but it's also very flat and we run out of data at about the 11 DTC size class. That's around a half carat in size. We just don't have any data about what this, this SFD is doing in the coarser sizes. So we can play around with modeling and projecting that forward. And if we do that, one very reasonable model is that that curve carries on and projects on a, on a coarser distribution. And the interesting thing with this is if we take this SFD model and we apply our June 2015 price model, we can end up with a, a price range for these diamonds of between 100 bucks a carat and, and over $200 a carat. And at 200 bucks a carat, this project looks really interesting. So there's clearly, there's upside in the, in the price potential for the Q1 to 4 diamonds. Unfortunately, we just don't have enough information at this point to, uh, to validate or discount the assumptions that we have to use to come up with this price model. But there's clearly upside and we need to do more work evaluating it. And then totally separate from that, we also took some of these yellow diamonds and had them polished. And the reason we did that was because we knew from the valuation exercise there was concerns about the color of the diamonds, whether they would be truly fancy colored diamonds, could they be polished into diamonds essentially that would be valuable and could be used in the, the gem and jewelry trade. And these diamonds are fancy colored diamonds, they can be polished into beautiful stones that are desirable in the gem trade. All of the stones that we've, uh, we've cut and, and submitted have been certified by the Gemological Institute of America and by Canadian Gem Labs in Vancouver as fancy orangey yellow diamonds. Uh, that orangey qualifier is really important as well. It helps to uh, increase the value. And, uh, and the other important thing is the, the level of saturation. The diamonds that we polished aren't very big. If, if you'd like to see them, please come by our booth. We do have them here, and I'm happy to show them off to you. The very intense colors, and, and the majority of the diamonds that we've had certified have been certified as fancy vivid orangey yellow diamonds, and that's the saturation level. It's a maximum saturation level you can get, and that's the certified uh, descriptor that Diamond Terrors will try very hard. They'll resubmit colored diamonds multiple times to try and get one of the certifications to come back as a fancy vivid designation because they get the highest price for that. And we just sort of submitted ours once and didn't agitate at all and that's, that's what we got. So as a comparison with the diamonds that we have polished, these stones are worth about three times what a top weight diamond of the same size cut and clarity would be worth. So there is clearly upside in that uh, in that price. We can quantify that to some extent just by uh, taking a look at, at the rough parcel that was valued. If we look at the, the 11 DTC size class, there's about 120 diamonds that were um, recovered 
20 of those diamonds in our June 2015 valuation were pulled out and valued at about $57 a carat. We polished two of those diamonds, and, and this is what they look like in the rough form, and then, and then the polished form. And then we could value what the polished diamond, the ultimate polished diamonds are worth. The typical margin that a diamond tear will look for when they buy a rough stone, cut it and polish it, and then sell on a wholesale basis, the, the finished diamond is about 15%. So if we take the wholesale price of these two polished diamonds, and we discount it by 25%, so basically build in a 33% margin, the value of those two, a reasonable estimate of the value of those two diamonds is basically what all 20 of those diamonds were, were valued for. So this is just quantifying it to the extent that the other 18 diamonds aren't going to come for free, so clearly there's some room to increase the valuation here and try and, and get a better handle on it. It's even more striking when we look at the smaller diamonds at the, the 9 DTC levels. So these are rough diamonds in the neighborhood of 0.2 of a carat. Um, they, uh, we, we polished five of those stones. If we take 75% of the wholesale value of these diamonds, uh, their, their combined value ends up being um, over four times what the 12 diamonds in that size class were valued at in that color, color classification. So there's room for, for upside in the valuation of the, of the Q1 to 4 diamonds. Just looking at the SFD uh, models in isolation and also looking at the exercise on the colored diamonds. So we need to do more drilling, we need to do more bulk sampling. Um, the really nice thing with where this project is located is we can be as aggressive or as incremental in, in those programs as we'd like to do. Being close to town, we don't have an exploration camp, we have a drill, we have fuel on site, we have the excavators that we collected our bulk sample with in 2014 are on site. So we can be uh, very selective or very aggressive as the case may be in, in evaluating these, uh, these properties further. The other nice thing when we look at the rest of our portfolio as we've been going through this exercise looking at the Q1 to 4 diamonds and how to move forward with that project is, as I mentioned earlier, we've moved a number of our projects to the point now where they're right at the discovery stage. The Mel project is a good example of that. It's located on the Melville Peninsula and we first acquired this four years ago over uh, an existing indicator mineral train um, from, the, from the public assessment files. This is what it looked like. Classic till samples, the size of the pies uh, indicate the number of indicator grains that we've recovered. We're looking at about 10, 10 to 12 grains were the most anomalous samples. Uh, after four years of really small incremental programs, this is what the train looks like right now. Very well cut off in the up ice direction. We're getting very high grain counts, up to 1,200 indicator minerals in a 20 liter till sample. There's a, there's a kimberlite source at the head of each of these, uh, these areas. And, and the really nice thing on the Melville Peninsula is this is an area where kimberlites outcrop. The Kimberlite's at now yet, all come to surface and outcrop. Stornoway's discovery at the north end of the Melville Peninsula and the Aviat Kimberlite's, they all outcrop. So this is a spot where a dedicated prospecting program could lead to a discovery this summer. We also have the chemistry here just to get across the fact that we know that we're looking at mantle-derived garnets, both pyrope garnets and eclogitic garnets that have been transported to the surface in a Kimberlite. Um, we also have two projects in the Lac de Gras area, a uh, very big area to the south of Diavik, which is a joint venture with our partner Dominion. Dominion's been working on this in the last several years, identifying targets, and they've tabled a budget for, of $2.8 million to, uh, to drill test the targets that they've identified. So that is definitely going to be a discovery stage project. And then our, our uh, Loki project immediately to the west. We have a number of target areas that we've also identified. There's a very prominent indicator train off of the monument kimberlites, and we have some targets that we've identified that need to get uh, drill tested up ice from those targets. A much more subtle but very real indicator train in the south area. And then we've also acquired the EGO5 kimberlite, which we think requires some further evaluation as well. Uh, it's totally unconstrained by the previous drilling that was completed there. And Piku in Saskatchewan, um, this is an area where we, we made initial discoveries. A few years ago, we've identified 10 kimberlites so far, we have another 10 unexplained indicator trains. Um, we're conducting geophysics. It started just yesterday on the property to come up with targets that we'll be able to put a drill on in our next drilling program. So that's our overall diamond portfolio advanced project at now yet, um, with an awful lot going forward in terms of uh, being in a jurisdiction where you can permit a mine, excellent infrastructure being on the coast, it's a big deposit, low strip ratio, and, and a very intriguing, potentially high value diamond population in the colored stones and then a number of other projects that are at the discovery stage. And I quickly just throw up this as our, our, our little shout out to gold. So this is the Hope Bay deposit. This is Doris right here. We've lifted this from TMAX website. So thank you. It shows all the mine infrastructure. You can see the ocean in the background. All that real estate in the background on, on the right hand side are our leases that we've been holding on to. It's the same geology, same structural setting, same lithologies, same mineralization style. So it's just another opportunity of a legacy project that we have in the company that we can try and get some value from. So. I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that. We have time for one question. 
Uh, maybe I missed it there. What uh, for now yet? How many uh, carrots do you think you need from a total bulk sample going forward that you'd be happy with the new pricing? That's a that's a good question. Um, you didn't miss it. I didn't say it. It because um, I forgot to. Um, our S, we can we're able to model and say well how many? There's two questions to answer clearly. One is the size frequency distribution. Is it a coarse distribution for the yellow diamonds? And and we'd estimate that we need a total parcel of about a thousand carats to get a handle on whether that coarse SFD is a possibility and, and is real. Um, so that means collecting about another 700 carats. Um, and then on a value side, we probably need in the neighborhood of, of 2,000 total carats um, to have a valuation that would be kind of plus or minus 25%. Thank you.